Good morning, everybody. Yeah, welcome to PC Evangelical and Reformed Church. It's wonderful to be able to begin the week with worship. And we have a lot of awesome things going on today. The Potter's Clay is going to be singing. Sandy Myers is leading us in worship. We have very shortly the presentation of Bibles to our two third grade students and the dedication of our Sunday school department for the academic year. Yeah, make sure you check the bulletin for any announcements that might affect you the most specifically. I have a few extra right here. Confirmation starts up this Wednesday at 6.15 downstairs in the Fellowship Hall, 6.15 to 7.45. And we also have youth group tonight at 5.30. So youth group at 5.30 at, at Bob and Brenda and Blake Mandalwick's house. Also, we need to remember in prayer, Virene Bettner in Appleton, Steve Keltish as he'll be having surgery possibly this month, and Bonnie Monty for the healing of her ankle. And also, we have a request. We're looking for people who could stay after church for a little bit and help us pick some stones off the church property, the land that was acquired a couple of years ago. We were hoping to get some of that done today. Also, I wanted to let you know that we have online giving now. So if you go to the peaceandpotter.org website, um, you're able, or family members are able to um, support the work of the church financially online on the website. I believe there is a 2% processing fee that you could either pick up or pass on to the church. It gives you that option. You could choose between general fund, building fund, and and missions or all the above with your gift. It's pretty um, straightforward. Also, um, are we, is the nurse, nursery is going to be open, um, nursery is going to be open ages two, three, and four after the children's sermon if anyone wants their kids to go down and fellowship in the children's center. Also, we have adult Bible study after church in the pastor's office. And we need to remember Wendy Lurkey in our prayers going through some tests. Any other announcements to highlight? Yes, Joanna. Okay, thank you. So, snacks right after church downstairs in the Fellowship Hall, and Joanna will be meeting with parents and teachers, and then off to the classes, ages two on up through high school. Yes, Dale. Uh, okay, um, Dale's got a truckload of pears, and so if anybody wants to take some pears home, see Dale, the truck's right outside, right? right out there. Okay, that sounds good. Okay, and this concludes our... Oh, Kathy. Oh, I almost forgot. Oh, well, happy birthday. Oh, I think I have it. I do have a list of anniversaries and birthdays. Dennis and Nancy Schwalbe have their um, anniversary coming up this week. Jeff and Carol Krieger, Jason and Becky O'Leary have an anniversary. And we've got a bunch of birthdays. Adam Crystal just had a birthday over in the sound booth. And also, um, today jo is Joanne Ebert's birthday. And this week, Danielle Foytick, Ron Vanden Bogard, Ava Weeding, Tracy Stefani, Riley Weeding, Jessica Gast, Amanda Hackbarth, and Kyle Hackbarth on the same day, Ryan Carls, Stella Stecker, and Shelly Streckert. So, happy anniversary and happy birthday. <laughs> and thank you. And this concludes our morning announcements. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. God, we love you and we worship you and we devote this time and beyond to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, at this time, I would like to have my two third graders come forward if they're here. Dylan Ballou and Sydney O'Leary.
Okay, thank you guys. We believe at Peace Church at third grade is an awesome time to start reading the Bible, and so we got you these brand new, large, comfort print, NIV, Pew, and Worship Bibles. Okay, I'll have you face the congregation, and let's have a prayer for Dylan and Sydney. God, I thank you so much that we can present to them the Word of God and that they're already in third grade. It's hard to believe that that much time has gone by so quickly. And I pray that these Bibles will be the foundation of their lives through faith in Jesus Christ. In his name we pray, amen. Okay, thanks for coming up. Okay, now we'll take a a moment to greet each other and welcome the Peace Evangelical and Reformed Church. Yeah, welcome the Peace Church. Yeah, welcome the Peace Church. I'm Pastor Mark. Hey, Kyle. Oh, really? That you were? How many years ago? Oh my goodness, I had hair back then and everything. (laughs) Welcome back. Okay, let's remain standing for the opening song of the service. There's two of them. We'll sing, we will glorify the King of Kings. We will glorify the Lamb, number 17 in the songbook, followed by Majesty, which is number four in the songbook. singing, everybody. We'll remain standing for the reciting of the Apostles' Creed, which is found in the back of the Red Songbook on the right side and also on the screen. 
I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the one holy universal Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And thank you. You may be seated. And we have a special music presentation from the potter's clay. The kids can come up and we'll have the children's sermon. Awesome job, Potter's Clay. Thank you. Hi, good to see you. Thank good to see you, Lily. How many of you guys? Oh, there's still more coming. Good to see you guys. Well, I hope I got enough treats. <laughs> How many of you guys like jelly beans? All right, I see a few hands. And what are your favorite, do you have favorite colors of jelly beans? Yes. 
Oh, you like rainbow color. I haven't even seen those, so they might be a different brand. Yes. Oh, really? You like those? You like the black ones? Okay, yes. Oh, you like the red ones. Okay, we got all different. Yes. You like the green ones. I haven't heard my favorite color yet. What's your favorite? The pink ones? That's my favorite one. You know, sometimes when I'm eating jelly beans, I'll pick out my favorite ones. I'll take all the pink ones out and just eat the pink ones because I want to eat the stuff that I... Because to me, the pink ones taste just like cotton candy. Those are the ones I really like. Oh, you do? You got cotton candy at home? And I also, I wish they could make jelly beans that were just pink ones and that's it, but they don't. You, they get them all mixed up with the black ones, the green ones, the red ones, and the yellow ones, and the white ones. So I separate them and pick them out. And at church, one of the things that we do is we separate out things so that you hear nothing but the Word of God. And we try to focus on the good things. And that's what Sunday school is all about, is picking out the good things and sharing them with you. Let us pray. God, I thank you that you have given us good things and, and that you have given us the ability to pick out the things that are good for us or best for us, and there's nothing better for us than your word. Thank you for the chance to start a new Sunday school year. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, I got a treat for you guys. Thanks for coming up. You're welcome. You're welcome. You're welcome. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. All right. Thanks for coming up, Abram. Okay. You're welcome, Abram. There you go, Ava. I still have... There you go. Thanks for coming up. Hmm? Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. At this time, I'd like to invite forward the Christian educators, and we'll have a service of consecration. So all those who are teaching Sunday school, helping out with Sunday school, filling in, come on up and we'll have a service of dedication. You can form a semicircle on the altar. Come on down. Okay, this is the, the Sunday School Department for the 2019-2020 year. Um, we have Rachel, Michelle, and Danielle, and, and Mar Maria, and Jennifer, and Dr. Tom, and Lynn, and Sherry, and Chris, and George, and Rhonda, and our superintendent, Joanna, that are going to be teaching and leading our students this year. And we will have our service of consecration. Ephesians 4. 11 and 12 says that God has given us apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers to prepare God's people for works of service that the body of Christ may be built up. Will you minister the love of Jesus to our kids as best as you are able? If so, answer, we will with the help of God. We will with the help of God. And will you encourage them not only to learn about the faith, but by your example, encourage them to live it? If so, answer, we will with the help of God. We will with the help of God. Amen. All the kids and students, and even the adult students, please rise. <laughs> will you accept your teachers as Christ has accepted you in order 
to bring praise to God? And will you seek to learn from them the best you can? If so, answer with, we will with the help of God. Okay, will the rest of the congregation please rise? <laughs> will you support our teachers and leaders in their ministry to the children of our church? And will you encourage the young by speaking to them of our God, by heeding the commandments of our Lord, and by showing them your love? If so, answer by saying, we will with the help of God. We will with the help of God. Amen. Let's remain standing and let us pray a prayer of consecration for our staff. Lord, we thank you for raising up an army of teachers and educators and staff to help our kids grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and give them purpose, give them your word, give them the power of your spirit so they can minister the grace of Jesus powerfully and prayerfully to our kids. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. On behalf of the congregation, I install you as teachers and leaders in our church school in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And may the children of our community be graced with love and wisdom along with the teachers. And may you, along with the students, discover joy and knowledge and the fullness of faith. And may all of you here today be empowered by the Holy Spirit to show the teachers and the students the wholeness of God's love so that together we may do his will with peace and joy and demonstrations of his power. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Our Bible reading this morning comes from Romans chapter 9. A lot of ministers don't like to preach from Romans chapter 9. For example, Alexander McLaren, one of the great 19th century Baptist preachers, had 98 pages of sermons on Romans 8 and zero on Romans 9. <laughs> You know, and I think maybe the reason why is because it talks about complicated subjects like the election of God's people, the sovereignty of God, you know, predestination and things like that. But we're going to see that Romans 9, 10, and 11 are an important part of Paul's argument showing that the gospel of God really is the power of God for the salvation and transformation of all who believe. Romans 9, we pick up the action in verse 1. And I'll be reading from the NIV Bible, the 1984 edition. I speak the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience confirms it in the Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, those of my own race, the people of Israel. Theirs is the adoption as sons, theirs the divine glory, the covenants, the receiving of the law, the temple worship, and the promises. Theirs are the patriarchs, and from them is traced the human ancestry of Christ, who is God over all, forever praised. Amen. Uh, that's as far as we're going to get today, but this is the word of the Lord, and may the Lord add his blessing to the reflection upon God's Word. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the Scriptures, and I pray now that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart would be faithful to the Scriptures. In Jesus' name, amen. Paul ends on a high note in Romans 8. He says, I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels, nor demons, nor the present, nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Yeah, you can almost do a mic drop after that. I mean, that's such a powerful conclusion. But there is an elephant in the room. What about our loved ones who are not believers? What about the people who are separated 
from the love of God. And if it is so obvious that God loves us, how come there are so many people who do not love him? And if nothing can separate us from the love of God, then how come his own chosen people, the Jewish people, are separated from him? If they could end up separated from God, then what about us? Those are the issues that Paul is dealing with in Romans 9, 10, and 11. And today we're just going to unpack Romans 9, 1 through 5 and discover a Christian response to loved ones who are separated from God. In Romans 9, we see Israel's past election by God. In Romans 10, we see their present rejection of the Son of God. And in Romans 11, we see their future restoration to the family of God. This is all part of Paul's argument that God really is working for the good of those who love him as well as for the good of those who will someday love him. And even though national Israel is presently in a state of unbelief about Jesus Christ, God is not through reaching out to them. I'm a Jewish Christian pastor. I am living proof that God is not done with the Jewish people. I am living proof that God is still reaching out to unbelieving Israel, just as he is reaching out to the unbelieving world yet today. Now, some of the Romans may have been thinking, Paul, I, I know you're glad that nothing can separate us from the love of God, but I bet you're secretly glad the Jews are separated from the love of God. <laughs> After all, you said in 1 Thessalonians 2.14 that the Jews killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets and drove you out of town. You said in 1 Thessalonians 2.16 that the wrath of God has come upon them at last. You said in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 that five times you received from the Jewish leaders the 40 lashes to the back minus one. So you can't fool us. We know that you're glad that they're on the outside looking in and you're one of the ones that are in. I remember years ago I was driving south on I-43 toward Manitowoc and this guy who was apparently extremely impatient, he passed me on the right side doing 80 or 90 miles an hour or something like that. And the only thing separating our vehicles was a coat of paint. <laughs> That's how close he was to my car. And I caught my breath. And then he cut right in front of me and cut me off in the high speed lane. And I was really scared. And then he zipped way on ahead. And it wasn't like I was driving slow. I was doing the limit or one or two miles over. Well, about five minutes later, I drove by and I saw a police officer had pulled him over on the right side of the road. I was like, yeah! Woo-hoo! <laughs> you know, <laughs> you mess with the bull, you get the horns, buddy. Woo-hoo! <laughs> I shouldn't have done that. <laughs> that's how I felt. And a lot of people think that's how Paul feels about the Jewish people not being in because they persecuted him so harshly, he's secretly celebrating like I was in the car that day. But watch in Romans 9 how he moves from the jubilant joy of the 8th chapter to a note of serious, somber sadness in the ninth chapter. He says, I speak the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience confirms it in the Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. Instead of being bitter toward the people who are persecuting him, he makes a sworn declaration of sorrow and anguish because the people he loves are separated from God. And this is how Jeremiah felt about the people of Israel in the Old Testament, even though they were persecuting him. He said in Jeremiah 9, 1, Oh, that my head were a spring of water and my eyes a fountain of tears. I would weep day and night for the slain of my people. And even though the Lord Jesus Christ was persecuted by the people of Israel, he didn't hold a grudge. He too wept over Jerusalem. Luke 19, verse 41 
He said, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, if you had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but it is hidden for, from your eyes. And now the enemy will come and attack, and not one stone of the temple will be left on another, for you did not recognize the timing of God's coming to you. Just as Jeremiah and the Lord Jesus wept over Israel in spite of the fact they persecuted him, Paul weeps over Israel in spite of the fact they persecuted him. Notice in verse 3 his spiritual passion for his people. Romans 9, 3. I wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, those of my own race, the people of Israel. Paul could have held a grudge for all the times that Israel persecuted him, pursued him, and lied about him, and tried to have him killed. He could have said, oh, God will get you back for that. But he doesn't do that. In fact, none of these things bother Paul nearly as much as it bothers them that they do not know Christ. Charles Spurgeon says, this great passion for the salvation of his countrymen gave Paul some perspective. Lesser things did not trouble him because he was troubled by the most important thing, the souls of men. Now, we get understandably upset if our employer treats us unfairly or if we don't get a raise at work or if the teacher grades our paper harshly or if somebody lies about us on Instagram or if we put money in the stock market and then the stock market immediately goes down. We're human beings. We're going to get upset about that. But do we have a great sorrow and unceasing anguish over the things that matter most? Do we grieve over family members and friends and loved ones who need the Lord? Spurgeon says you will be delivered from smaller concerns if you occupy yourself with the larger concern of the spiritual condition of your people. And there will be less time left over to linger over your worries. I notice that. It's if I take a few minutes and forget about my parochial pedestrian problems and focus on ministering the love of Jesus for somebody else, for that time I'm helping somebody else, I'm not even thinking about my worries. And that's kind of Paul's perspective on life. Instead of feeling sorry for himself for being harassed and persecuted, he's out there trying to help people as much as he can and pray for people as much as he can. Some of you have family members that you've been praying to get right with God for as long as I've known you. You have a great sorrow and unceasing anguish in your own heart. You think about what an awesome Christian your son would be if only for just one minute he would bow his head and say, Lord Jesus, I need you. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. I open my heart to you as my Savior and Lord. Make me the kind of Christian you want me to be. Help me to be the best I can be for you on this earth. And you long for the day when that happens. And the Bowler Jacks were one of the bands that played at the Gospel Fest last month. And Blake was telling us a little bit about his testimony. He said that um, he had a, a grandma that prayed for him all the time. And, he, and sh her, he wrote a song about her, and it was called Hey Sugar. And he says that really does require some explanation. He said that whenever I came to see my grandma, she would say, Hey Sugar, how are you doing? And he was in a time in his life where he was making a lot of bad choices, and he was far from God. But no matter what, his grandma would greet him by saying, Hey Sugar, I love you, and I'm praying for you. And it was her constant love and prayer and Christian example that over the course of time got through to Blake, and he eventually repented of his sin, and he believed on Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior, and he's in ministry with his wife today in part because he had a powerful, praying, godly grandmother who held on the heaven's gates and would not let go until God blessed her. 
We need more powerful, godly, praying grannies and parents and friends who will hold on to heaven and say, Lord, I will not let you go until you bless me. I will not let you go until there's been a breakthrough in my son's life, in my daughter's life, in my wife's life. Please, God, hear my prayer. Kind of like the woman in Luke 18 that kept knocking on the judge's door and he wasn't even a righteous judge, but she kept knocking until she got an answer. God's looking for people who pray persistently and never give up. Paul was so passionate for the salvation of his people that he even says, I wish that I, if it were possible, that I, I could be cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers. Of course, this can't happen because nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's why Paul says, I could wish that I myself were cursed. The word cursed means to be eternally condemned, not only to be cut off from the Christian community, but to be cut off from God forever in the lake of fire. Paul is saying, I love my people so much, I'm willing to spend eternity in the lake of fire so that they could be saved. Just as Jesus allowed himself to be cut off from God for the salvation of his people, Paul wishes that he could do that also. You know, Moses said something similar in Exodus 32. Remember the people who were worshiping the golden calf and God was mad at him for doing that and he was going to wipe them out? And Moses said, no, take me instead. Blot me out of your book. And God basically says, I'll blot out of my book whoever I want to blot out of my book. But you do see the heart of Moses and Paul for their people. But not only do we see his spiritual passion for lost people, we see the spiritual privileges of his lost people. You know, Romans 3, verses 1 and 2 says, what advantage is there in being a Jew? Paul says much in every way, but he doesn't give us all the every ways. Here in Romans 9, he gives us eight advantages of being an Israelite, being a Jew. Number one, their adoption as sons. God told Moses to tell Pharaoh in Exodus 4.22, Israel is my firstborn son, and I told you, let my son go so he can worship me. God was adopting Israel as his people so that they could make known the word of the Lord to the community, and they could make known the promise of the coming Messiah to the whole world. Now, this doesn't mean that they were automatically saved because the only way to be saved is by grace through faith in Christ alone. But it does mean that God adopted him in a very special relationship to make his word known. The second advantage Paul mentions that they had is they had the divine glory. Exodus 3. The divine glory appeared in the burning bush to Moses and said, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Exodus 13, 21 and 22, the divine glory appeared to Israel in a pillar of cloud by day and in a pillar of fire by night. 1 Kings 8, 10 and 11, the glory of the Lord filled the brand new built up temple in Jerusalem. And in the Christmas story, Luke 2, verse 9, an angel of the Lord appeared to the shepherds, and what? The glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. The Jewish people had a revelation of God's glory. The third advantage is that they had the covenants. Covenants are treaties and agreements that God makes with his people. They had the Abrahamic covenant of Genesis 12 that through the descendants of Israel, the whole world would be blessed. And that came true because Jesus Christ is a descendant of Israel. Through the Jewish people, the world also got the Mosaic covenant, the Ten Commandments of Exodus 20. We also got the Davidic covenant of 2 Samuel 7, that God promised David that you would never fail to have a descendant on the throne, and today that is true in the person of Jesus Christ. 
And we also, through the Jewish people, have the new covenant. Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34, I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. And that covenant was ratified beginning at the Last Supper when Jesus took bread and gave thanks and broke the bread and gave it to the disciples and said, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And he took the cup and he said, this is the new covenant in my blood, and then he went to the cross and enacted it. Fourth advantage that Israel had, they had the receiving of the law through Moses on Mount Sinai. Number five, they had the temple worship where their priests were the ones who could offer sacrifices for the forgiveness of sins. The sixth advantage, they had the promises of the coming Messiah. Isaiah 9, 6, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, the government will be on his shoulders, and he'll be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And this is fulfilled again in the Christmas story, Luke chapter 2, verses 10 and 11. For I, unto you there is good news that will be for all the people in the city of David. A Savior has been born to you, which is Christ the Lord. And number seven, they had the patriarchs. They had a bunch of godly examples to help them live a life for God. They had Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Daniel, and Job, and Jeremiah, and Hezekiah, and Josiah. And number eight, the people of Israel had the greatest privilege of all. They not only had the patriarchs, they not only had the prophets, they not only had the priests, they had the Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 9, 5, from their human ancestry is traced the coming of Christ, who is God over all, forever praised. Amen. And that's a powerful verse demonstrating the divinity of Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity. They had all of these blessings, all of this knowledge, but they rejected it. Exodus 32, they worshiped the golden calf. Later on, Israel had 19 kings, and all 19 kings did was evil in the eyes of the Lord. They were O for 19. The kings of Judah, there were 17 of them. 10 out of 17 did what was evil in the eyes of the Lord, and one of them repented. And they didn't listen to the prophets, and they ended up crucifying the Son of God. And that's why Paul is praying for them and weeping over them and trusting in God's plan to bring as many of them to Christ as possible before it's too late. Well, it's very easy for us to hear this history and how they rejected it and point the finger at him and go, you guys are bozos. What's the matter with you? It was so obvious that God loved you and you rejected him. But you know what? Every time you're, you point the finger at somebody, there are three more pointing right back at you. What are you doing with the blessings God has given you? Because the United States of America is as blessed as any country has ever been blessed since the time of Israel. We have Bibles all over the place. We have study Bibles, audio Bibles, podcast Bibles, downloadable Bibles, Bibles in big print, Bibles in little print, children's Bibles, teen Bibles, adult Bibles. What are you doing with the blessings God has given you so that you can know his word better? And we live in a country where we are free to worship as much as we want. And we can listen to Christian radio, Christian podcasts, Christian YouTube, Christian programming. We have so many resources. We have an embarrassment of riches to help us become the best Christians that we can be. Are we taking advantage of the blessings that God has given us? You remember the story in Luke chapter 10 when Jesus was teaching in the home of Mary and Martha and Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made for supper and Mary wasn't helping her because she was sitting at the Lord's feet listening to everything she said. She got criticized for that. 
But from her perspective, she's thinking, it's not very often that the Son of God is giving a lecture series in my house. This is probably not going to happen again. I'm going to take full advantage of this and learn as much as I can with the time that I have. That's the way we should feel about all our blessings. We only have so much time on this earth. The other day, I was 18 years old. Today, I woke up, and I'm 52 years old. You know, as well as I do, how fast time flies. Don't let your youth get away from you. Use the time that you have to get to know God better, to get to know the riches of his knowledge better through the Word, through YouTube. And I know that you guys are busy and you don't have time to read everything that's out there. I don't have time to read everything that's out there. So I want to encourage you to pick out some of the really good resources. I want to talk to the kids here for a little bit. Um, one of my favorite cereals is Lucky Charms. How, how many of you have ever had Lucky Charms cereal? You know what that is? Now, I used to put my hand in the box, and I didn't eat the cereal. I just took out the yellow moons and the and the orange stars and the pink hearts and the green clovers and the rainbow marshmallows and I would just eat the marshmallows. I wanted the good stuff. I still do that, but that's beside the point. I think it's still, <laughs> it's still something I want to do. I, I, I take the time for the stuff that I like. That's what you do in life. You, you don't have time for everything. You take time for the stuff that is best for you. And that's what I want to encourage you to do. That's why we have a Sunday school program. We take the time to give our kids the very best that we have, to learn more about God. So not only so that we can be good Christians ourselves, but so that we can help the lost people in our life. Because the more you get to know God and learn about him, the more that the Holy Spirit is going to have available that he can use to help other people. And if you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as Lord, man, it would be awesome to give your life to Christ on the first day of Sunday school. You'll never forget it. 34 years ago, on September 13th, this week, it's coming up, I got down on my knee in my dorm room and I accepted Jesus. I said, you know, Lord, I've been taking, it, I've been taking for granted all my blessings as a Jewish person. I realize I'm not saved. I don't want to be that way anymore. I want to give my life to you. I want to encourage you to do the same thing. Give your life to the one who gave his life for you and receive his blessings and his assurance of eternal life. Jesus loves you. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. Amen. Amen. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. We'll remain seated and sing our song of commitment. It only takes a spark to get a fire going.
you. I want to recommend to you, you should sign up for David Jeremiah's podcast. I don't know if it's called The Turning Point or David Jeremiah. Um, I, I think he's the, the best preacher in America, and you should sign up for David Jeremiah. And we're not going to have him much longer. He's been ministering for 37 years at Shadow Mountain Community Church, and, and he's a treasure. Yeah, and so I, I recommend signing up for, for that podcast. Um, Sean McDowell, S-E-A-N, McDowell. That's a good one for the youth. I recommend Sean McDowell a lot as well. Okay. For prayer, we want to pray for Virene Bettner, Steve Keltish, Keltish, and Bonnie Monty. Do you have any other special requests? And We'll pray for her. Okay. Yes, Amy. Okay, we'll do. Lynn. so blessed that she can do those travels, isn't she? Okay. Yes, Diane. Oh. Bonnie. Yeah. We'll keep praying, too. Okay. Um, yes, Jennifer. Troy's mom. Adam. Okay, awesome. Pray for that. Pray I can read my handwriting. <laughs> um, yeah, Beverly. Are you talking about Dallas? Okay, pray for Dallas. Yeah, Renee. If we can just Welcome back to the States. Safe travels. Okay, safe travels. Yes. us pray. And God, we thank you for the chance to share our joys and to share our concerns. We pray for Virene Bettner as she's getting ready to make the trip to heaven. And we pray, pray for a peaceful transition into your presence. We pray for Steve Keltish that the doctor does an awesome job on his procedure and that he comes out feeling a whole lot better. Pray for Bonnie Monty for continued healing of her knee in the name of Jesus. 
We pray for Anne's friend Kathy, who's fighting infection. May she find healing and freedom and faith and hope in Christ. <clears throat> Lord, we also want to pray for Reagan's team as her volleyball team from Marion University are coming back from Colorado. We pray for safe travels for them. Pray for Lynn Stecker's dad to be encouraged by the gospel and the love that you have for him and that he would believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. We pray for her mom as she continues to fight the good fight. May she find hope and strength in Christ. We pray for Olivia over in England that she has a good time and comes back to us safe and sound soon. We also pray for Wendy Lurkey going through some tests this morning. Help her to find comfort and peace in Christ. We rejoice that you did that powerful work in Fuzzy's life and that he's worshiping with us today. We thank you, Lord, for the healing testimony. We pray for Dallas Wenzel being treated at the ICU in the hospital. May his faith and hope and trust be in Christ. We pray for the doctors to do an awesome job ministering and helping him to make a full recovery. We also pray for Paul Brandt, who's being treated for illness, and we pray for healing for him in the name of Jesus. We pray for Ray Brantmeyer to continue to improve and get better. They had to do another procedure this week. May there be healing for him. For Cheryl Ranke, continued healing for her as well. And we also pray for Adam and Sherry and Don and Daryl Parsons as they do karaoke Christian music ministry later this month. We pray, Lord, for our leaders. We pray for President Trump and Governor Evers and our senators and representatives to do what is right and just. Give guidance, we pray. We trust the word of the Lord in Proverbs 21.1 that the king's heart is in the hands of the Lord and that you direct it. We pray for our troops that you would watch over them as they watch over us. Most of all, God, we thank you for Jesus who taught us to pray the Lord's Prayer, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As the ushers come forward, we'll take up the morning offering.
please rise. Father, thank you for these gifts. Help us, help us to use them wisely for your work. In Jesus' name, amen. We'll remain standing for the closing song of the service, Start a Fire in My Soul. The song will be coming up on the screen. the Lord with us today, and may you fan into flame the gifts God has given you to be a blessing to others in the world for Christ. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen. And God bless you and have a wonderful day, and go in peace. And we have cake downstairs.